let's try and bring up the energy a bit in the room. I feel like we've all had our coffee and uh, our, our cookies, so let's try and, and bring up the energy in the room. So I'm joined here by uh, Tom. I'm going to try and take up as little time as possible so that then we move into uh, the fun bit that uh, you, you're all kind of like here for. Um, so if we just get started, uh, we've been on this, on this journey of um, uh, making sure that we make our content available where there, the capability sits. Um, so if we move on to the next slide, uh, I'm just going to quickly start with some of the, the, the key trends that we see uh, are happening um, in the market in terms of the, the current landscape that applies not only for historical data, but also for, for data as a whole, right? right? These are recurring themes that have come, uh, have come up throughout the sessions today. So the increased uh, use of uh, automation uh, and AI and machine learning, right? So the data... Um, the data that you use uh, to be able to um, extract insights uh, is actually key, right? Because the outputs will only be as good as the, the data quality uh, of, of, of the data that you're using for that, right? So um, actually, our tech history data is, is very, uh, very much uh, widely used in the market. It's a market-leading offering. But also, uh, it is used as a, as a benchmark against some of the alternative data sets that um, our, our colleagues here today have, have uh, um, walked through. Um, we were also seeing a significant uh, increase in terms of usage around compliance and risk uh, um, use cases, right? Customers trying to, to meet these increasing uh, regulatory requirements. And um, they all need to be able to access this data at speed, uh, be able to scale up and down based on, on their business needs, but also in an easy way to access the data, right? Um, so all of these things kind of like came to mind when we started working with Google in terms of, okay, how do we make sure that we help customers in this journey? And then finally, total cost of ownership. Who doesn't have a challenge, a budget challenge, trying to make sure that whatever dollars you put in your business uh, actually give a better return to, um, to your investors, right? So how do we um, go together with customers in this journey and help them address this, uh, this uh, TCO challenge was also part of the question. So um, essentially, uh, this has uh, come up uh, a few times, right? Our Tech History Archive is, is worth um, of, uh, over 20 years of, of history. Um, and it covers across 400 plus exchanges and OTC and uh, specialist data sets, right? Um, it is a big, big data set that, you know, um, will, will take a while to, to get the truckloads of tape shipped to, to a customer site or, or literally a couple of days maybe even to, to, to compute uh, over, over this data sometimes, right? Uh, so the world has changed and uh, that's why Refinitiv is also trying to, to make sure that we are um, up to speed with these changes, right? So this, uh, this five petabyte uh, archive that grows on a, on a daily basis is actually very, um, very widely used across the industry. We've got uh, over 1,500 active users uh, of this data um, that you know, cover uh, use cases both on the sell side, the buy side, and uh, all the way from front, middle, to back office. So um, if we move on to the next slide, actually, what we're um, basically uh, making available today is um, making sure that we offer a refinitive tick history managed service um, offering. Essentially what we're doing is we're allowing you to access the data where the capability sits. So we're letting you forget about having to provision for storage, we're letting you forget having to wait for the data to download and manage this yourself. Um, because we're basically making all of these venue by day files available in a refinitive uh, managed project within BigQuery. And then we're letting customers do all the, 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 the good things that they're gonna, they do with the data, right? But um, also just access uh, this data where, they are, where, they, where the capability sits without having to have um, the worry about um, uh, the worry and the cost um, that, uh, that this uh, entails. So um, essentially, we're talking about speed. We're talking about removing the need for uh, recording this, um, the real-time market data, storing, managing, and uh, making sure that they uh, provision for storage and compute themselves, but also removing the headache of having to manage backups and disaster recoveries. Just think about all of these resources that are today allocated to managing your tick um, database, allocated to looking at alternative data sets, trying to look at other um, data sources that will uh, enable you to really gain that edge. Um, so now, without really um, taking up much, much more time, I'm going to pass it on to Tom, who's going to uh, show us how um, BigQuery helps, um, helps, um, helps us leverage some of the um, really um, great data that's available on, on TIC. Great. Thanks, Hatalina. I want to give you a quick introduction to BigQuery for those of you who don't know what it is. 
BigQuery is really <coughs> interesting because it's externalizing a technology Google built for ourselves. Google at its heart has been an advertising company for a long time. We also run a number of products. Today there's nine Google services with over a billion monthly active users. We need somewhere to store that insight around user activity, search data, much of that for training machine learning models to provide insight back to our products. So that means that we're receiving trillions of data points and we're receiving petabytes and exabytes of information that needs to be accessed by Google employees. So now we have 100,000 people working at Google, an exabyte's worth of data, and all of those people want to find insight from that data. So BigQuery is the externalization of a technology that we've been building since 2008. Inside Google, we call it Dremel. Dremel is the only data warehouse at Google, and Dremel is all about making people's lives easy. All the data sits in a single place, a single data warehouse accessible by everyone, and every user that submits a query, whether that's directly writing a SQL query, or through code, or through using some dashboarding, it basically creates a virtual cluster for every single user. So we have millions of calls available on demand, and for every single query that comes in, we estimate and right size and learn over time how much processing power you'd need to optimally return that data. So when we look at the value proposition of BigQuery, much of it is around how do you spend your time thinking about insight and analysis? When you've got 100,000 employees, you want to make sure that the 100,000 employees are focusing on insight and customer value, and not how do I size my cores that I need, and what kind of disk do I need to store my data in, and how do I extract this from a CSV? That simply didn't work for us, and this is why we brought BigQuery out into the market. Particularly in financial markets, we found a really great fit with Refinitiv around tick data. It's voluminous. There's a very large amount of data being added every day. There's very wide columns, and people only need a subset of it, so they need a way to drill into it very quickly. Hence why our internal name for BigQuery is called Dremel. You want to slice through and find just the insight you need very, very quickly. So BigQuery architecture is conceptually simple, but very different to other offerings. We delinked storage and compute. So simply, send as much data as you want at BigQuery, and we'll suck it up. You can stream it in. You can throw millions of rows per second at us. Organizations like Twitter send every single tweet, a copy of that is sent into BigQuery. All the insight and analytics that goes through companies like Snapchat and Spotify, the user engagement metrics, they stream that into BigQuery as well. Refinitiv are copying their data through tick history into BigQuery. And we make that storage fast enough and available enough, enough, and we have 11 nines of durability. So the data isn't lost, and it's always available. Then what we did was we broke it in half and said, compute is separate to storage. Because I might have a really simple query, I just want to sum some values together or just get a single row back, and I need a very small machine. So we'll give you a very small machine. Because we take the heuristics of every query that comes to us. We could say, well, what table are you querying? What are the filters you're giving us? What's the date range and the access? So we know where those files are on disk. So we co-locate the compute with the storage and say, right, we need 7,000 machines over there and 200 machines over there pull up this data, aggregate it, and return the results to the user, and make it available as quickly as possible. From a scaling model, this means that it's like every single user of BigQuery having their own data warehouse that scales to exactly the size that they need to return queries in human time. Rather than waiting overnight for 12 hours or 24 hours, we give you virtual access to that. So a couple of interesting numbers around the externalized cloud version of BigQuery. So one of our larger customers stores 250 petabytes of information in BigQuery. From a commercial perspective, the cost of storage is very cheap. We then charge you per query when you access that data. This is exactly the model we see through tick history with Refinitiv. Refinitiv is storing the data. Customers that want to access it simply pay per query. You could send a single query and pay for that, or you could send thousands of queries, and it completely scales with your usage. The largest query size that we know of in Google Cloud was a five petabyte query, a single query that was scanning and aggregating five petabytes of data, and they did that more than once. And that query touched 10 and a half trillion rows of data. So that was quite a lot of compute needed to process that one. And the largest and fastest customer we know ingests about four and a half million rows per second. And there's thousands and thousands of customers doing this today, the biggest customer being Google itself. 
So I want to give you a quick little demo to show you some insight into the scaling model of BigQuery. So Jupyter Notebook, everyone else had a Jupyter Notebook, so I thought I'd fit in with the crowd. So some little help utilities, just like everyone else, import all the normal stuff, build some data frames, a little authentication helper library to get me in. And I'm going to do four very simple queries. They sound simple until you want to try and return them relatively quickly, and actually you think about the infrastructure that runs behind it. The first one we're going to do is we're going to compute high-low bars for LSE using level two data over one day. We're going to compute the high-low bars on an hourly basis for every single instrument across LSE, which is a medium amount of data. It's not particularly voluminous. So I run this query. And what you'll see is we're gathering the query statistics below it. So what we want to look for is how much data goes in, how long did it take, and how much comes out the other side. A couple of interesting numbers worth looking at here. So we process 1.8 gigabytes of data. From a commercial perspective, that's super interesting, because we've only charged you for 1.8 gigabytes of data, yet I know this LSE data set today is over 100 terabytes. So despite the fact we've had to scan through it, because we knew where those files were, we could very quickly find them and only charge you for a small subset. In the process, we scanned through 62 million rows. And here's a really interesting number for you, human time. So the actual query itself, it took four seconds. But if you look at the compute behind the scenes and you add together all those machines, how long they're running for, actually they spent one minute 43. So we got a speed up of 25x on human time to get your query back. The interesting thing with BigQuery is that the bigger and harder your queries get, the more we can speed it up because the more compute we give you. And we keep on scaling it, the harder your queries get. So I'm doing a slightly more complex query, exactly the same as before. We're computing time bars on an hourly basis using level two data in LSE, but we're gonna do it over a month rather than a day. There's a lot more data going in, and there's a lot more rows being processed. So what we see now is we have to scan through 1.4 billion rows. That's a lot more data that had to be scanned through. And it's starting to get reasonably chunky, but don't worry, we're really going to turn it up in a second. 40 gig of data in, it took us six seconds, and we spent 36 minutes of compute time. So we're, we're starting to scale pretty quickly. All right, let's do it over six months. We're going to calculate high-low bars per day, LSE, level two data, over the course of six months. So now the numbers really start to rack up. But we're still not going to have to wait 10 or 20 minutes. We're still going to try and return it. And the goal of BigQuery is human time. How long can I comfortably sit here and wait for it to come back without having to leave and get a cup of coffee every time? All right, that one's done. So now we have to scan 7.5 billion rows. What you find is past a certain limit, there's an amount of data you can fit in memory that can fit on a single machine. And scaling is relatively easy. You buy a bigger server, you get some more RAM, you get some bigger disks. Then you need to make them scale out from each other, and it gets harder. So here, we've now got up to 7.5 billion rows, and actually we've spent 3.5 hours running that query behind the scenes. We had a speed up factor of 1,400 times compared to human time. So my final query, we're going to run it again, LSE, level two data, compute high-low bars per day for the last two years. So interesting stat that David Craig set me up for this morning, but I didn't realize. Every day, Refinitiv capture about 38 billion data points. That's coming into their data systems. So fingers crossed, we should see this query processing the equivalent of every single data point that Refinitiv captures on a daily basis. We're having to scan through every row. We're having to do an aggregation for it. We're grouping it together. We're doing high-low bars by instrument for the whole of LSE, for the whole of level two data, and the results have come back. It took 30 seconds. I'm going to graph this to make life easier for you. I will admit this is a really hard graph to produce because the scales just completely break when you start to scale it out. But what we see across the bottom is the scaling of human time. So you can see how long it took us while we were sat here, and I'll make the table available so you can see it as well. So it took us four seconds, six seconds, nine seconds, and the really big one was 30 seconds. But in those 30 seconds, what we did was we had to process 34 billion records, and that took 21 hours of compute time we spent almost an entire day's worth of compute for that single query to scan through that data. And in the process, we have to emit 3.5 million records. For every instrument over two years with those high-low bars, there's a huge amount of data. 
that's now instantly available. So you do your summarization, your aggregation, it stores it in a table. Your data scientist can then take that data and do further analysis and aggregation, and that's available for as long as they need it to be. So the key thing here is that as a data scientist, when you're trying to access tick history data, you're not writing queries that conform to the compute that's available to you. You're not thinking about how many instances and how many servers you have. You're thinking, what questions do I want to ask? What insight do I want to get back? Google's challenge is making enough compute available, making it so that it can scale correctly and getting those results to you. And that's something we've had to do for the last 20 years as a business. And this is what we're making available in partnership with Refinitiv through our Tick History product. So that is the end of my demo and the end of our talk. Thank you very much. <laughs> Worth mentioning that um, if you're keen to play around with, uh, with some of the Tick History data and other key data sets, um, they are available in the DSA that um, you, can, you can get access if you get to the lab's corner. All right, thank you.